morning, everyone. Morning and welcome to English for Academic Purposes and Plagiarism Symposium. Um, the aim of today's uh, presentations is well summarized in a um, mission statement that students have put together. Um, and it says that today is about bringing together, gathering around the topic of English for academic purposes and plagiarism, featuring presentations from undergraduate and postgraduate students. As your program um, indicates in the morning, first few sessions we have undergraduate students and in the afternoon we have postgraduate students. Um, from today's presentation and working with students who have uh, organized this event, um, I need to say that Cornish students are very enthusiastic, independent and critical thinkers, and they will prove that to you today. Um, they will possibly challenge us on thinking about academic English, boundaries and plagiarism as well. They will explore topics from various points of view, including the challenges of international students, um, that are faced with academic English and with often the new notion of plagiarism and what it actually means for them when they're starting their thesis um, in, in postgraduate research. Many questions will be raised and personal experience shared. Is plagiarism shaped by material factors? What social, cultural, cultural and linguistic factors challenge international students? What does plagiarism has to do with learning styles? And how does one address addresses the vow when writing their PhD thesis? So a huge range of topics um, on this is going to be explored. It certainly promises to be an excellent morning um, with more students talking on these issues. And I wish to thank the students, and especially Anna Chang here, for organizing this and working many months to um, bring this together. Just a few um, housekeeping issues. Uh, I'd like to ask you to turn off your phones or put them on silent, please. And uh, could presenters please keep on time. Um, and I'll, here we'll have the iPad with timing, which is going to come down so that you know how much time is still left. We will also have a live, stream, live streaming and time um, from various places. So um, I need to ask you for your permission to use um, these um, also photos and still, still and video material uh, for any future um, references, any future uh, material that we might collect. So if you have any, any uh, objections to be using your photos, could you please let Anna or me know. Um, we would like to also ask you to keep your morning tea to 10 minutes. I know it's very short, but the coffee are just outside um, because we would like to finish the day right on dot at 1.30. Lunch is going to be served at 1.30 um, and that's going to be um, concluding today. So I, it is my great pleasure to introduce um, Professor Daryl Evans, Vice Provost Learning and Teaching at Monash University, who is going to open today's event. Fantastic to be here, and as you're going to see a lot of presentations, I've decided not to do one of the, the typical Daryl Evans PowerPoints this morning and, um, and just talk to you to introduce um, this symposium. I think it's a fantastic um, opportunity um, for Monash really to focus in uh, upon this whole question of English for academic purposes and, and, and plagiarism and really think about the student cohort that we have um, here at Monash and making sure that we provide them with the best um, opportunities and experience um, to really make an impact when they move away from uh, the university. So that whole idea of, of gathering um, and staff and students together uh, for this whole purpose, I think is really exciting. Um, and I think the cross-disciplinarity um, that I've seen in the abstracts and then speaking to, to Marta and Anna, I think is really um, um, quite tremendous. And to see that you've got undergraduates and postgraduates represented again, making sure we get the whole flavor um, of Monash um, in this perspective. And I really want to thank um, Anna for that. She's asked me to say a, a few words about a, sort of a, a Monash perspective um, in, in terms of how I see um, and this particularly and this area being particularly important. And also focus a little bit perhaps selfishly um, on that I, I do research into communicating to different audiences and how I think perhaps this uh, aligns um, with that. So the first thing I would say is the connections to the graduate attributes that we have at, at Monash University. Um, and as you'll be aware, um, they sit nicely on the website, but the unfortunate thing is if they just remain on the website and are not used um, in any way. 
And I think if we just um, perhaps refresh our memories to um, of those two graduate attributes, I think it really demonstrates how this is a really important topic today. So the first one is um, responsible and effective global citizens who engage in an internationalised world, exhibit cross-cultural competence and demonstrate ethical values. I don't think anyone could argue, therefore, that what we're doing today doesn't really focus in um, upon that particular attribute. And perhaps even more, when we think about the second attribute, which is critical and creative scholars who produce innovative solutions to problems, apply research skills to a range of challenges, and communicate perceptively and effectively. So again, I think this whole message today of, of EAP is really critical um, to being able to enable our students to really go out of the doors knowing that they really have those graduate attributes and are able to, to demonstrate them um, and, and really widely. So we live in this global community um, and therefore we communicate in very different ways. And I want to be just a little bit interactive um, as I usually am in my presentations, um, to ask you um, who currently, uh, by raising of hands, who uses a mobile phone? Okay. Who uses email? Who converses via Skype or FaceTime? Okay. Who texts? Uh, who uses social media? Okay, slightly less. Who still writes a letter with a pen and paper? Oh, that's really good. Uh, much better than an audience I was with recently. Uh, where there was virtually no hands shot up, really a bit depressing um, at, at that stage. Um, but that just demonstrates the change in technology um, that we've had and the way that then we think about and communicating. And to me that means that communication is even more important. The skills associated with communication are becoming even more important. That means that we're going to be speaking to different audiences, very different audiences, that we wouldn't have spoken to before. Much larger audiences than we would have spoken to, uh, to before. Audiences that are very much distantly, um, 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 culturally um, and um, um, geographically distributed across the world. And think people, people that we wouldn't have perhaps spoken to um, previously. Therefore, whatever message we have, um, whether it's an academic message or social message or whatever, has greater potential for impact. And therefore, we need to be able to make sure that we're using communication skills appropriately. And so having effective skills to be able to do that thinking about this particular subject area is absolutely critical um, to that, to be able to have credibility, to go out to those audiences and people to really believe in the message that you're giving, the passion that you, you need to be, uh, be able to demonstrate and therefore people really to take your message to heart and therefore hopefully produce change. And therefore for me, um, as an academic, I think about how I introduce communication skills training and within my students and to make it really fit the purpose, real world um, sort of activities. If I just touch on, on writing skills, well, as a scientist, um, we're often castigated for poor writing skills uh, in, in many ways. Uh, so I want to give my students, though, ways that they can demonstrate communication um, activities in different ways. So I would, for instance, um, get them to, to, or I would remove an abstract from the paper and get them to rewrite um, the abstract, get them to really think about um, the paper that's been written and get them to think about how that they would summarise that to a different type of audience and we could pick the audience that perhaps the abstract um, is written to. Whether we um, get them to write a grant proposal, I'd often get my students to, to write um, the first part of the grant proposal and get them to really think differently about what message they've got to get across this grant awarding agency that might be very different to the type of message that they would have on that subject from others. Um, I usually get my students to write um, 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 articles to a fictitious newspaper, um, particularly as I come from a, a medical faculty um, originally. I would then get them to, to discuss a particular uh, illness or, or problem, but in the context of a lay language uh, audience um, that is there, um, and pick the newspaper for the, for the level of that, that particular audience. Or get them to devise patient-focused information leaflets, and you can think about all the different ways that you might be able to do that in very other different um, um, spheres. To really get them to think about the message, but also get them to think about how they communicate that message, how the academic elements um, to that writing are very important. But then let's not forget about the oral element of that, and the oral skills that our students uh, need to have, and therefore providing opportunities to have open presentations for for students to really get into, to discuss and to debate things. That really gets the idea of thinking about um, English for, for academic purposes. Um, I get many of my students to near-peer teach, 
so the slightly older students teaching the slightly less experienced um, um, students. And really that element of, of communication is a completely different mindset um, for a lot of students. They engage very quickly, um, but it is a very different um, thing that they have to do. Um, and then in one of my particular um, student um, um, component um, elements that I used to teach, I used to get my students to do the, what I would call in the UK, the BBC News um, Interview, what I call here the ABC um, News Interview, the, the three or four minute um, interview where they're going to be tested by the, um, um, by the news um, 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 reader um, and answering questions on a particular subject area and thinking about how they give their responses how they talk to that particular audience um, that is in front of them. So I think there's an array of possibilities that we can use um, at Monash to really enliven the experience for our students, but also giving them the opportunities both in the, the oral communication side and also um, in the, the written side. Um, and I think possibly the, the involvement of e-portfolios and all of those other things really enables us to have all those different possibilities uh, built in. I really think that skills training, therefore, should be an inclusive element um, um, to the way we design our, our, our units um, um, and our courses. So just a, just a few sort of opening thoughts um, um, from me. So it's now, now my pleasure um, to introduce our, our first speaker. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Andrew Johnson on with us. Um, Andrew has a background in um, literacy studies and philosophy. He's been te teaching actually here at Monash since 2002. Um, his teaching and research focus is writing and in cultural learning processes and the way we learn to use language in different social contexts. He's currently coordinating lectures in academic and professional writing. So please join me in welcoming Andrew to give his keynote, The Ream of One, Just How Original Do We Expect Students to Be? Oh, thank you. Um, it's, so, it's so great to be here. And uh, Matthew... Uh, uh, mentioned this to me some time ago, um, and it was uh, just amazing to see how he's brought together and other people have got involved and uh, brought together this amazing idea of, of uh, actually engaging students in the processes of communicating ideas, developing ideas, knowledge production, and all of that that, that we academics think is is sort of very vital. It becomes the, the centre of our existence, if you like, as academics, but um, often there's that separation between what we're thinking and what uh, students are doing about writing and about communication, so I just think this is, is such a fantastic event. Um, and uh, the, the challenge for me, and I have to confess that, uh, the, the challenge was this uh, paper that uh, Matthew had set, I think, on a uh, course um, uh, some time ago uh, for reading for students, but uh, to revisit it. Uh, it was a paper that I wrote with my colleague, uh, Associate Professor Rosemary Clarahan, uh, a number of years ago. And uh, rather than just sort of read that paper and just redo that paper, which I just couldn't, I couldn't do today, I, I think I have to rethink it and, and had to go back and rethink what, what that paper was about. Um, so I, I thought I'd start just uh, by talking a bit about the paper and what, what we were doing in 2005, or actually before then, in preparing this paper, um, and uh, some of the context to that. And the focus I want to get today is, is to talk about what's changed since then, uh, since that moment, and how, uh, finally, um, I guess, uh, what hasn't changed as well, there's some things about student writing and about engagement with ideas and making knowledge through writing that haven't changed. Uh, some of the issues that I hoped to raise in that paper originally uh, uh, about originality uh, are still, still relevant today. But finally, also to think about what we can do differently. Uh, in that original paper, some of my focus was on, I think it was a bit of a critique. It was a critique of some assessment practices that were going on, some ways in which essays were presented to students. And I, I thought today it might be better to think forward and look forward to, to different ways we could do things that might actually overcome some of those issues. So I, I don't know to what extent people might have had a look at this uh, paper, a ream of one's own. Um, I, should, I should clarify the language there, the ream, the ream idea. Some of you will be getting the reference there. It's a reference to Virginia Woolf. Uh, a room of one's own, an essay about needing to make space for women writers, uh, 
particularly, um, and the necessity for space to do that. So there, there's a little connection there, I think, today, with the idea of making space for students, uh, student writing. But um, the, the, the idea of the ream, if you're not familiar with that, it's a, it's a discourse analysis or linguistics concept of um, in looking at a, a text or even just a sentence, the theme, the theme is the topic that this is about. So today's topic is about originality, about student writing, about English for academic purposes. The ream is meant to be what the, the speaker or the writer brings that's new to that. So the, the idea of having a new something to say, and can I say again, the, this is the challenge of today for me, because I'm not sure that I have anything original to say. I'm almost certain that I have nothing truly original to say that people won't have heard elsewhere and heard in other contexts. Um, but uh, this was the question of that moment in 2004. Uh, what, what is the ream for students? What, what do we expect students to produce? What, originality do we expect them to produce? Um, so uh, this is just a little opening idea. That, uh, you may have heard the quote, there's a, there's a, a, a very ancient quote, uh, the, there is nothing new under the sun. So going back to the earliest writings, people were bemoaning the fact that there was nothing much new to be said. So the problem of originality goes back a long way, this, you know, the anxiety or uncertainty about having anything new to say. Um, and the, the quote there, Edward Young uh, wrote a very important book, and I'll come back to that, uh, an important essay actually on this uh, in the um, mid-1800s, uh, about, uh, 1700s, sorry, uh, about originality. And this was a really important cultural moment. And, uh, I just reread some of that in preparing for this paper and came across this quote. I thought it seemed very apt. Uh, uh, back then, some time ago, it was not that long ago really, but uh, uh, we had some uh, ideas about originality and about the emerging plagiarism debate, uh, which, which really prompted the paper. So um, I don't know how many people will remember what, what it was like in 2004, 2003. I, I would say now, looking back, that it was the real sort of first burst of attention to plagiarism. And we all, I guess, would have some idea of why that was at that moment. The, the internet had been around for uh, a long enough time, but the, the real sort of emergence of the idea that people could access massive amounts of information in a very easy way. And the thought that students were now not really writing, but they were just copying. And there was a lot of anxiety. It was a cultural moment of very you know, great anxiety about uh, a challenge to the academic integrity of essay writing and student writing. And uh, it, it led to a lot of uh, discussion around what universities needed to do to stop the scourge of plagiarism. And there was a lot of discussion about um, ways in which we had to sort of clamp down and make sure that students were doing the right thing. And there was a tendency to focus on legal and sort of criminal and moral issues around plagiarism. And this is really what prompted Rosemary and I to, to come with our approach, because we thought something was being missed in that discussion. And that was a, a very simplistic idea of, of what originality was. There were certain assumptions, it seemed, in the discussion of plagiarism that said originality was uh, sort of uh, all important and transparently clear to everyone what that what was meant by originality and being original. So just a little bit more, just out of interest, what was new then, and it's, just, it's so shocking always to look at history, even recent history, um, and uh, at that moment when we were talking about plagiarism, Facebook was really just getting started, 2003. I don't think many people were on it yet. It was still just a college student phenomenon. Uh, YouTube was just getting started in 2003, which is astonishing, 2004. Um, and uh, these, these massive sort of what was called Web 2, it still is, I guess, the second generation of the web, um, I guess fueled some of the anxiety about, about writing and that, that, that there wasn't going to be a place for original writing but it continued to um, uh, lead this discussion about uh, what, what, what are students doing and how are they using the information now and how are things changing. 
Uh, interesting, Twitter, Twitter didn't even exist then. So th these things were all quite new. And there was one other bit of software that was new at the time, and that was Turnitin, and that, that really prompted a lot of discussion as well. It was uh, a leading piece of software in this debate about uh, what, what we do about uh, plagiarism and about copying and about new ways of thinking about text and using text. Um, so it was a, it was a kind of uh, exciting moment of all of that. Um, so just out of interest too, I thought this was fascinating. <laughs> Just checking back with Turnitin today, and and there is a moment too. This is really interesting for Monash at the moment because Turnitin back then was being discussed as something to be introduced across the university, and it's taken quite a while. Uh, in fact, this year is the first year that Turnitin has been used widely across Monash. So very very interesting. I, I think that's a, it's a fascinating history to look at. Um, but just the the impact of that. Some of those numbers. This is where we are now. Turnitin now has 337 million archived student papers, and and what this made me think about was the question of originality again. What what does this say about originality? How can it, these uh, this incredibly enormous archive and and that's just the Turnitin archive, the archive of all the written text of the world, uh, now available through Google almost. Uh, a touch of a button and what what does this mean about originality we still have to think about this um, not to mention the 130 million academic papers uh, so looking looking back at Turnitin and this is not a this is not a critique of Turnitin but one of the things that's changed for me is my attitude towards at that time uh, I was kind of a bit uncertain about Turnitin and what it would mean for students and would it would it mean that we focused on this kind of uh, law and order approach to plagiarism and originality? Um, but in, in looking at their text now, I mean, it's an incredibly useful piece of software. I just think we still need to talk about originality. Um, and this idea here that, that Turnitin is still promoting and is part of this cultural idea uh, that we can distinguish original from unoriginal. In a, in a fairly simple way. Um, I, I know from working with students, and most academics will say, the great use of Turnitin is that we can have this discussion and we can have these debates about what's original and what's not original. Um, but there is a tendency still that in, in the wrong hands it can be uh, thought of as a simple binary distinction, a simple distinction between what's original and what's not. Um, so uh, they acknowledge in Turnitin, this is also from the, the sort of information around the, the use of the software. Uh, I think it's really great. They're acknowledging that, um, that these, these issues of originality and student writing are disciplinary specific. They, they, they change from institution to institution, from location to location. Um, and they acknowledge that our culture places this huge value on uh, originality and uh, intellectual property. So this continues uh, to be the kind of focus of plagiarism discussions. Um, so this is where I think this is what hasn't changed. A great deal has changed in the last 10 years. Uh, the explosion of social media, as I was trying to allude to there, this idea that social media is uh, changing the way people write and think about writing, I think is, is worth looking into. But there are still question marks and questions about originality. Um, so back back then, what what Rosemary and I looked at was the idea of originality and looking at it from a historical point of view, and looking at this particular distinction between original and non-original text as a kind of simplistic or a, 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 an assumption that many people would make that you can distinguish original from unoriginal. Uh, through a computer program and, and there it would be. Um, and we, we actually look back at the history and realise um, that originality has a history. The concept of originality, of being original as a writer, of being an originator of ideas, an innovator of ideas, this actually has a history. Um, it comes partly in the English context out of uh, the debates that led to the first Copyright Act. So I've, I've in indicated here the 1709 Statute of Anne, it's called the Statute of Anne, Queen Anne, um, and this act 
was a resolution of a dispute that had been going on between booksellers, basically uh, uh, a question of parallel importing, the London booksellers being undercut by Scottish booksellers who were producing the same work, so they'd get a copy of the book and they'd print it in Scotland and import it back into England. And so it was a, a major question mark about the profitability of uh, um, book publishers and the book publishing industry. Uh, but very interestingly, I, I love the language here of the, 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 the statute, that it was an act for the encouragement of learning. It was felt that this dispute between booksellers and publishers was actually impeding authors and publishers from publishing. It was tied up also with censorship debates, issues around censorship, but it was seen as impeding the ability of people to put ideas out, and so they needed to resolve this issue. And they resolved it in a really interesting way, which was to highlight the rights of the author. So the author of the work became the rights holder, which had not previously been considered at all. The rights all resided with the booksellers. So, um, this act had a huge impact. Uh, previously, the idea of an author, the whole idea of an author as an originator or an innovator of ideas, had not really been uh, prevalent. There were different ideas about authorship and originality. What it led to, in a sense, and it, it's hard to say what led to what, what was the cause, what was the effect, but essays like Edward Young's, and I cite this again, the, the Edward Young essay, Conjectures on Original Composition, began, authors and writers and thinkers, philosophers, began to think about the question of originality and what made great writing and what made interesting writing and so on. So they were starting to deal with these issues and Edward Young's book, is, or essay really, has been cited many times as a kind of key moment <coughs> where he published this uh, idea that originality was to be prized above imitation. Prior to that, perhaps in literary circles anyway, the idea of imitating the classics, imitating the great writers of the past, and interestingly for us that didn't mean who we might think of as the great writers, it wasn't about imitating Shakespeare or uh, Milton and so on, it was about the, the Greek uh, classics and the Roman classics. And the idea of imitation was not the pejorative term, it wasn't the pejorative term that we have now. Imitation or copying was not necessarily seen as a bad thing, but Edward Young and from him uh, forward, many authors and writers about writing started to emphasise originality as a much greater thing than imitation. So the balance shifted a little bit. But even just the idea that you could distinguish imitation from originality in some clear way began to be a sort of cultural phenomenon. Uh, we know it now as the romantics, you know, the romantic movement, romanticism, that really took this idea and took it forward in all sorts of domains like art, philosophy, and literature. Um, so uh, the, the interesting thing here, one of the interesting things here is if you look at Edward Young, in order to prosecute his argument that we need to emphasize originality, uh, he uses all sorts of allusions and classical figures and quotes and, if you like, cliches that what might be you know, seen today is not very original writing. I think that just highlights the complexity of this, that, that in being original, we always use the past. In fact, the, the truly original is very hard to recognize. No one has a frame for it, a context in which to understand it. Okay, so this is some of the, just the background really, and this, is, this hasn't changed, this is the history of originality. And as we said in the, in the original paper, as we put it, we, we live in the shadow of this moment that most of our cultural phenomena now in, in sort of contemporary Western uh, scholarship as well as cultural life is influenced heavily by this idea that originality is the highest value. Being original, being unique, being innovative, and this is not going to be a critique of the idea of a creative culture or innovative culture, but just recognising that it has a history and it comes from somewhere. It's not just a natural thing. Well, of course, we should all be original. We should all be innovators. Uh, it's, it's a cultural uh, outlook, a cultural mindset. Uh, and there's some questions there maybe about yeah, how much it's changing. OK. One, one way to see how this has changed over time is to, to recognize that despite it seeming to be fairly clear cut that originality is better than imitation, 
originality is to be prized above imitation in writing, in art, in culture, we, through the last two, 250 odd years, have just had a sequence of ongoing controversies and challenges about this very idea of originality. So we're at the end of this process, the cut and paste culture, what's called the, the mashup or the, the cut and paste culture that we live in now. Perhaps, even some of you are letter writers still, not such, a, not such an issue, but um, uh, this is the kind of culture of, say, students that we might be thinking about. There's a lot of discussion about that, that they have a different attitude toward text, towards uh, production of knowledge and so on. But uh, what we experience there, this is, I don't know if you're familiar with Banksy, the uh, graffiti provocateur, if you like. But the idea within art circles of the mix-up or the mash-up of two things that don't go together, so the, the political sort of graffiti or stencil mashed with the Mona Lisa, and that bit of a DJ headset there. <laughs> uh, the, the broader idea, I mean, a really interesting idea about copyright and the whole the sort of challenges of a global economy where you know, uh, intellectual property such as the Gucci, I think it's a Gucci, I've got my handbags here, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, the Gucci handbag, you know, reproduced by makers in other places and you know, it looks the same. What's the difference between that bag that you buy for $20 in a market uh, in a developing country compared to the, the real thing, which I gather costs upwards of 1000 1500 is it the materials? Is it the, the fabric? Is it just the look of it? So these questions of original and copy, authentic and fake, are uh, very much part of our culture. This was a moment a few years ago, some people may remember it, uh, a painting that won a landscape, major landscape prize in Australia. Uh, the artist happens to be a friend of mine, so I, I like using this one, but um, uh, he, you know, he's painted uh, a landscape which is effectively a copy, and everyone can see it. It's the same landscape. The reproduction doesn't do it justice, of course. Uh, it doesn't look exactly the same, but the question mark is there. Was this an original painting? Well, he painted it, uh, but it's uh, seen as a copy. In what sense is it an original work? Does it deserve a prize? Our sort of notions of what original art should be led some people to say, this is well, this is just copying, this is not authentic art, it doesn't deserve the prize, but then the debate goes on. Um, um, more, even more recently, I don't know, some of you might have seen the copyright dispute, uh, someone's made a claim against Led Zeppelin for the riff of the opening of their uh, very well-known song, Stairway to Heaven. Someone's saying, mm. well, that's a copy of that riff, and it opens these questions. We have this cultural anxiety and uncertainty about originality. Um, and I thought this is always worth noting, the, uh, the Australian culture of the download and the copy. Again, it's not about cultural production, but it's about cultural distribution and how people view cultural products as intellectual property that must be respected or as something to be shared and the borders are not so uh, visible. So this is really just to say though, that these issues are still live and they still go on and there are certain cultural anxieties about it. Um, from the perspective of student writing, though, we have to come back to this question of student writing. Uh, in one sense, when looking back at my paper, and I can see how people would be looking at what we wrote then <coughs> and saying, well, you're just arguing the sort of postmodern line, what's called the postmodern line, that, well, it's just a free-for-all. You can't have anything original. There's no such thing as an original text. Everything is a copy on some level. The border between original and unoriginal is impossible to find. So what are we saying about student writing? Are we saying, let's, let's give up, let's give the ground and say, students can write whatever they want, uh, or just copy, or on the other hand, we could just abandon the essay as a, as a form and just not require students to do that. I'm not sure it's as simple as that. Our concern was to show that the question of originality is not simple. It's not a simple issue of original versus unoriginal. And if we pretend that it is a simple issue of original versus unoriginal with students, I think we do them a disservice. We do student writers who we're hoping to teach to write a disservice because we're not allowing them to see the complexity of originality. Um, uh, obviously, we could say that 
originality is very difficult. It's very difficult to say whether something is original. Uh, in this sense, what we want to be careful of is with students not asking them to do the impossible, not asking them to do the impossible and produce something original when it's really very difficult to produce something original. Um, so this is something to be aware of. Uh, on the other hand, an emphasis on uh, originality can lead to uh, what's called an excessive novelty. Uh, this is Marcel Duchamp's urinal. Are people familiar with that? Uh, an art provocation, really. Uh, uh, you know, in order to do something new, uh, the avant-garde does radical and controversial and sometimes objectionable things, like taking a urinal and placing it in a gallery as a work of art. Raises all sorts of questions. Not really original. He didn't make the, the urinal in question, uh, but it challenges all those sorts of ideas of originality and copy and what what is actually. Uh, right. Um, so in encouraging this culture of originality or not addressing it, not questioning it, we can also lead students, you know, if we push them towards originality, well maybe we're pushing them in the wrong direction towards a kind of just doing things that are novel but not necessarily good or uh, valuable. Okay, I'm going to run short of time. So there's a danger also of, of starting to look at student essays in this framework or context of art and literature I've been talking about. You know, big concept, big ideas, art, literature, philosophy. And there's a danger of sort of framing the student essay in that as if we're expecting students to become uh, artists or literary authors necessarily, when what's at, what's at stake is actually communicating effectively, perceptively in very big context. But I don't think we can throw out the question of originality or not address it. The alternative, and I think this is why I would emphasise the originality, is that the alternative is to make the question of student writing and plagiarism, a question of law and order and morals exclusively, and it just, it gets really complex at that point, and uh, not necessarily helpful in terms of students' writing, but their monitoring of their own moral behaviour and so on, which shifts the dialogue between student and teacher as to, we're working together to create, you know, uh, essays that are meaningful and so on, to we're here to police your thoughts and your writing. So I think the alternatives are not great, but I think focusing on originality is still worthwhile. Uh, and it still acknowledges, this is a really important quote to my mind in terms of it, being a teacher of writing and someone who recognises these processes of how people learn to write or how they use language, how you know English for academic purposes, how to learn in that context. That uh, whole, uh, that, that in fact, the way we learn language is by imitation. And we need to acknowledge that and deal with those issues rather than ignoring it and saying, just saying to people, well, just use your own words. You've heard that expression. Just use your own words. Yeah. So uh, recognising the complexity of originality, I think, is really, really important. Um, so between, between all of this, in, in our original paper, as I said, uh, Rosemary and I ended up looking at... Uh, a few examples of essays uh, or essay tasks that we thought un unhelpfully made too clear a kind of distinction between original and unoriginal and put the focus on students being original in ways that I felt were impossible for students to actually meet. So we were, we were a bit, bit critical of those, those ideas. But um, I, I thought it would be better today to, to think about the future and the forward looking yeah. What can be done instead? What can be done instead of focusing on uh, the problems of originality? What can be done? And I sort of, you know, I like three points there, but what, one is, and I've already made this point, I hope, that, that we admit the complexity of it. That we actually, uh, not even just admit it, but engage students in that discussion. I'll come back to the other two in a second. But engaging students in the debate, and that's really, I, I should really end at that exact moment and say, look, that's where we are today, that's what this, is, uh, this day is about, is actually engaging students in the same activity. If we as academics are writing and questioning these ideas of <coughs> originality, or whatever it is, that we engage students in that writing, so not writing as a student essay just to get some marks and all the rest, but actually engage students in, why are we writing, why do we write, why do we communicate? Um, 
but on the other hand also clarifying expectations. So rather than simple ideas of, well, you've got to use your own voice and be original in your essay, we're looking for an original point of view here, actually clarify what it is we're expecting students to do. And there's some uh, points from a great book on student writing uh, by one of my predecessors um, that, that clarify that there's all sorts of different authorial motives. Being original is maybe one of them, innovative is one of them, but there's all these other ones, like agreeing with points of view is quite useful. And the last one of those, retracting or recanting a previous position of one's own, I thought that was appropriate for today. That's kind of where I started with this paper. So. Um, also acknowledging, and uh, uh, Daryl's given five or six great examples just in, in opening, and I, I thought this would be worth uh, doing, that, that you can think about authorship differently, that we don't have to just stick with the dull old essay as the form, but we can have different modes of authorship or production of knowledge. And the idea of curating rather than originating. Why not focus on curatorship of ideas and knowledge as a valued activity instead of you have to come up with some novel position? It shifts the, the debate. And also recognising that authorship is not individual. Part of that romantic idea was that the individual genius of the author. But we live in a world that text and knowledge is produced collectively and collaboratively, and we need to emphasise that with students. Recognise the whole host of new problems there about group work and some of that. Mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, the, the medium of the web and the medium <coughs> of the technology allows us to do so much more, and this is what we have to think about: is, is ways of, in, of harnessing that in in ways that are still uh, fitting our academic, if you like, our academic or scholarly pursuits of, you know, critique or understanding knowledge and so. Okay, and the last one, <laughs> shifting the burden of originality, if you like, from the student writer, from the writer, to the setting up the context. I think someone like myself uh, having to think about how do I construct situations for students to engage meaningfully with the ideas and the knowledge production. Uh, and again, an event like this is, is exactly what we can think about. A, a way of getting students to think differently about how they present material and ideas. So I'm really looking forward to the rest of the sessions today uh, to hear more ideas about this and more debate and discussion and uh, I hope to be able to answer some questions but maybe not right now. We're going to have a panel okay. in after okay. the yeah. Yeah. I'd like to invite people to thank Andrew. stage of proceedings, Daryl again, thank you so much for opening the symposium for us, and uh, to Marta, who has been driving it so successfully and effectively. Also, I'd like to thank everybody here very, very much for coming along on such a glamorously <laughs> cold day. Um, just a few technical points, if you do need to pop out. Uh, there's an exit at the back of the theatre, my right, and that's probably the easiest way to pop out if you need to go to the uh, amenities. The real motivation for the symposium was actually the excellence of the work that uh, students in the unit which I coordinated produced. One of those students was Miss Anna Jung, and uh, I'd like to introduce Anna and let her take it away from here, so thank you. Um, so I've been given the honour of being the first undergraduate presenter to the inaugural student process symposium, so thank you all for being here. And I'll be introducing the EAP today, but um, before I begin, I wanted to thank the staff of Monash University in particular, uh, Dr. Matthew Pissoneri and Mrs. Marta Smith uh, for, um, for providing opportunities like this um, possible for student engagement. Um, so why, why talk about EAP? Um, I just wanted to begin by briefly outlining why 
it's important to have discussions around the topic of English and academic purposes. And plagiarism, and why I chose to be involved in this symposium. So from an undergraduate perspective, so most of us into high school, uh, into university straight from high school, was limited or no understanding of how to write academic pieces. Um, questions that arise um, include, um, you know, what are academic conventions? What are uh, key features of Western scholarship? How do you avoid plagiarism? Um, or even more simply, is personal language appropriate in academic writing? And um, due to the vast and complex environment of academic institutions, there are diverse expectations with very little consensus on the scale of understanding of what constitutes a good academic writing. So the expectations of one lecturer could be very different from another lecturer, and cross faculty consensus can be even more difficult to find. So consequently, many students find themselves um, unequipped to successfully navigate this labyrinth. And what does that mean? Well, it translates as an un unintended choice between academic failure and academic success. And I understand why there's a lot of the impression of that the excuse of what? Thank you. 
society. So after all, um, in order to, to develop the critical skills that is often critiqued as lacking in pragmatism, um, the foundation skills must firstly be imparted upon the students. There are certain conventions that should not be taken lightly. Therefore, students are able to access the skills prescribed by pragmatism, whilst having freedom to challenge convention as championed, or convention which is championed by critical EAP. Proponents of critical pragmatic EAP argue that in turning to literature to decide what is appropriate and um, what is acceptable in comparison to what can be perceived as dangerously challenging convention, students are able to understand the implications of risking certain convention over others. Um, consequently, students are exposed to the discourses of pragmatic and critical EAP, but they have the choice to choose, they have the choice to choose their practice. Howard and Haley, who are proponents of this um, middle ground, argue that this approach can equip students with the tools offered by pragmatic EAP and simultaneously foster active engagement with the education. Engagement can be seen as the confidence and ability to decide active conventions that ought to be followed and those that could be disregarded. By engaging with key literature from the discourse, as well as presenting case studies on how critical pragmatic EAP can be employed in teaching, um, these proponents of critical pragmatic EAP outline a persuasive argument for a critical pragmatic approach. However, having said this, um, Um, they suggest an approach of pragmatism. So one would assume that um, 
Um, this approach can have a bit too much of a focus on technicality and convention. session of presenters. That's refreshing to have a presentation without a PowerPoint. That's wonderful. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Mr. Graham Manish, who uh, again was part of the cohort one that took the Unit in English for Academic Purposes. Uh, Graham, if you'd like to come and begin your work, just make it Can everyone hear me clearly off the bat? I'm uh, suffering from the flu, so I do apologise in advance. Uh, before I uh, present my paper, uh, I'd just like to provide a little bit of background on my fourth and final year of uh, Spanish and Latin American Studies at Monash University. So, buenos dias, amigos. And um, I was encouraged to undertake these studies by my daughter who studied at Monash. We also study Spanish, but is uh, currently overseas at Memorial University, where she works in Newfoundland, and she's also studying. I undertook the, uh, the subject early in the year with Matthew, and thank you very much, Matthew, for um, teaching that subject to us, and I've, I have found it to be invaluable, and certainly in the last semester where I had to write a number of papers on the post-war construction of Madrid in Spanish, the lessons I learned in English assisted me greatly in Spanish. So what we find there is that uh, in learning another language, we focus on things which we don't even think about in English. And I hadn't thought about indirect object pronouns, direct object pronouns, subject pronouns, and verbal clauses in English since 1972, when I was in form two, when we had a little grammar book at a boys' grammar school. Uh, so they're all new to me again. But again, thank you, Matthew, for getting the focus there. I'm going to be a little old-fashioned. Um, I see a few people put up their hands and said they, uh, they still write letters. Um, so I'm not using the PowerPoint. I'm going to read to you uh, extracts from my paper and um, please be patient with me because I am suffering here today. From an outside perspective, universities appear to be challenging society's social norms and the status quo. The teaching relations between students and academics have led many uh, academic participants to writing papers on issues that encompass critical discourse of English and academic purposes, PAP, classes in university settings. In the paper, I set out to explore whether universities should develop EAPs that unshackle students from the constraints of academic fraternity and the different perspectives of the discourse. Effective EAPs can provide the opportunity to achieve social change and not restrict students to the status quo. I sought to critically examine the EAP debate and the interactions for both student and academics um, in the way in which massification impacts on cultural discourses in universities. I drew upon some social theory from papers uh, authored by experienced academics in the AP arena, which included our learner uh, Matthew as well, and academic modernity in the relationship between teaching and learning and the impact of discourse neutrality, which was the main areas of focus uh, within the context of the AP debate. The availability of academic literature on EAP is extensive and is con a considerable amount of the literature is from overseas universities. I chose to explore individual literature from well-qualified Australian academics and authors, uh, Pisaneri and Pennycook, and, uh, as well as overseas academics from authors Banesh and Brain, which inform on EAP. I also explored relevant philosophical literature referenced by these authors in their papers, such as uh, Bergen uh, Habermas's theory of communicative action. The majority of papers on EAPs, however, all appear to be written by academic participants. Thus, I argue the discourse 
this discursive academic participants which have the education, the opportunity to write about EAP, have lived the realities of teaching EAP, they are aware of the difficulties facing students with little or no understanding of the cultural issues. They are aware of the importance to students of the cultural engagement through educational and linguistic programs. I argue that there is a quality of research on EAP which are from an academic participant perspective. Due to a lack of student participant observation research, I have focused on a quality of literature in relation to the experience of Banesh as an academic participant. Furthermore, in terms of the EAP debate, the majority of findings are deeply subjective and are related to academics' personal experiences. I have included some anecdotes from Sarah Banesh, who has written a number of books on critical thinking and considers the EAP teacher's role in the context of assisting psychology students absorb as much information as possible and the option of encouraging her students to seek information through interactivity. Banesh's approach is very relevant as she reports on negotiation with <coughs> and dissidents of students whilst teaching EAP to psychology students in Sydney at Sydney University in New York. Students did not want to read about the struggle of a US immigrant as they were tired of those stories and were more, were more concerned with their own proficiency test. She compromised and provided more focus on the proficiency test and simultaneously set about implementing a class social experiment that would involve providing students from different racial backgrounds. In the end, she sought feedback from the students and she tells us that the syllabus was modified to take into account their concerns. Banesh questions whether she had changed the conventional approach to EAP teaching through prom prom promoting a confrontational stance towards current discourse practices. She raises the issues confronting EAP teachers of how to enhance the relationship between teaching and learning. She argues that if students don't know how to perform tasks for which they're being evaluated, when and how are they supposed to learn to do most of their work? Banesh concluded that where the focus of academic class is to learn a body of information rather than make sense of it, students will struggle with learning the content. I agree and certainly agree with the method that students are taught has a significant impact on their ability to learn. Pranesh provides the reader with anecdote of Professor Hardy at the same university who has prescribed a text entitled Power and Society. And he expected students to complete the task without appropriate instruction. She, she argues that in a dialogic teaching environment with a critical approach to EAP, there's an interactivity which ensures students learn how to do the work and understand the content. Importantly, her approach of viewing the historical, theor theoretical and political issues is supported by anecdotes which she analyses within the EAP. Framework of the university environment and the way to develop a critical pedagogy at the university. Banesh successfully argues that critical thinking enhances the relationship between EAP and content teaching. And that EAP teaching bolsters content teaching. Alistair Pennycook is a professor of language studies with over three decades experience in language education. The title of his paper, Vulgar Pragmatism, Critical Pragmatism in EAP, displays his view on pragmatism in the context of EAP. The author quotes Alison stating that pragmatism in as English as a second language, applied linguistics and teaching of an EAP establishes a dominant and largely unquestioned discourse or ideology itself. And that EAP pragmatism dons a conservative stance towards dominant academic and socio-political orders. And thus ultimately a position that attempts to change students to fit themselves into existing structures. Thereby preserving conventional academic culture. Furthermore, Alison argues for an EAP that provides pragmatic stance that is more critical as opposed to the position of neutrality. His vision is for an EAP that, that views language both domestically and internationally with a focus centered on cultural engagement through education and linguistic practices. He strongly argues that if we are to have a pragmatic approach in the context of teaching an EAP, it should be critical rather than vulgar. His idea is that an EAP can provide the opportunity to achieve social change and not to restrict students to a status quo. He's concerned that critical pragmatism may have limited relevance in an EAP program because vulgar pragmatism, 
serves to uphold social norms and beliefs as well as inequitable social relations. I certainly argue that Pinnacle, in conjunction with Allison, recognise the direction of EAPs as a consequence of academic modernity. Massification and where society is headed. Pinnacle recognises that pragmatism is an essential element of an EAP and therefore the importance of recognising EAP as pragmatic and consequently conformist. Importantly, quotes Allison, who insists we must not assume that a discourse on educational status quo seeks to maintain itself by suppressing dissonant voices. Benny Cook does not disagree with Allison. However, he believes they have dissimilar understanding of how we understand the nature of education. The status quo, academic culture, conformity, and the need for opposition. Nevertheless, both Allison and Pinnacle agree that EAP is not characterised by total uniformity, with the, with the later contending that EAP should be contextually sensitive. Pinnacle is concerned with the potential narrowness, narrowness of pragmatic necessity and argues strongly that it is necessary to distinguish between vulgar pragmatism and critical pragmatism. It appears that Pinnacle is arguing that vulgar pragmatism fortifies social norms views and philosophies that preserve inequitable and social relations. I also argue that discourse neutrality, neutrality reinforces conventionalism and maintains ideologies and paves the perilous road of mastication and academic modernity. I have also not included literature, I have not included literature from vulgar pragmatists, pragmatists as I believe that vulgar pragmatism and critical discourse are not interchangeable. Some academic, academic participants in the field of EAP have written literature on the EAP debate that is key in defining the discursive type of EAP which is the consequence of massification. The internationalisation of universities from a student perspective also assists in analysing the different perspectives of the discourse. Examples provided these writers exemplifies the need for critical thinking in universities as well as highlighting the accepted convention of discourse neutrality and the social position of marginalised non-native speaking students that are attached to the AP today. Uh, Matthew Bissoneri, the author of Walking the Tight Ropes and Inquiring to English for Academic Purposes, reflects on Habermas's theory of communicative uh, rationality. He reminds us that Habermas has argued that contemporary culture of social, scientific and critical inquiry in Western societies reflects the community of nationality, nationality that has constituted the modern Occidental life. According to, uh, to Matthew, Habermas's rationale is that social actors can furnish reasons in support of this, this speech acts and that consequently social actors in dialogue can take a yes-no position on the validity of the claims to the truthfulness of another person's acts. Pissoneri unapologetically recommends that a new academy is required that provides access to higher level of education and retains scholarly values and the importance of EAP programs in the context of higher education. He certainly is a heretic in that regard. Pissoneri reveals that the purpose of this, of this paper was more to deepen the problemization of the critical discourse of EAP. I'm cognizant of time, so uh, I'll move forward and like I said, that, um, I personally argue that EAPs are vital in assisting students understand how to make sense of information and consequently how to learn that information. I argue that it has been demonstrated that a dialogic approach to a uh, teaching approach for EAL, EAL uh, benefits both native and non-native students alike as students experience interactivity and increased cultural awareness. According to Pinnacle, pragmatism works to reduce all human problems to the level of technical difficulties and solutions. Therefore, I argue that a neutral approach to pragmatic discourse conjures the notion of vulgar pragmatism. I argue that vulgar pragmatism, which is juxtaposed against critical pragmatism, confirms the current situation in our universities generally and the direction that society seems to be heading. EAP is not monolithic and the need for critical discourse and the unshackling of conventions imposed by the status quo are both necessary to achieve higher education and deliver EAPs that bolster content learning for all students. And certainly in that regard, um, without wanting to make a political statement at all, the, um, the, 
pushed by um, the federal government to change the ways in which universities deliver educational programs um, to assist uh, students at universities in engaging in English language and so forth. Thank you for your time. Very welcome to make a political statement on the hallowed grounds of any university I trust now and in the future. So thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, I'd like to welcome the people who have joined the uh, symposium online. That's wonderful. We've been streaming the event and we've got several people who are connected in. Uh, welcome. And again, welcome to everybody here. We'll be now informed by Adam and Chase, and then we we'll have a panel discussion and then a cup of tea. So welcome Adam for the next presentation. Thank you. So in recent years, um, there has been a growing number of international students enrolled in Australian universities. And this paper that I've written examines international students' education in, in an ESL setting. In particular, it explores the impact that previously acquired learning styles have on international students' education in Australia, the various strategies these students employ to adapt to a foreign environment, and different tests that can be used to determine their success <coughs> in Australia. Um, stu studies such as Marlena and Smith and Kawada have been used and they present conflicting perspectives on the extent to which culture has an impact on international students' learning style. Um, to investigate these issues, a range of scholarly literature has been used and um, multiple viewpoints gathered to achieve a holistic perspective on the challenges that these international students face while undertaking tertiary studies. So, um, as Keith defined, a uh, learning style as as Keith has defined, learning style is the individual learner's response and psychological behaviour of processing information from their learning environment. As many researchers have defined, identified, students from different cultures have different learning styles. And Smith and Kawaja found that Asian culture students tended to have high regard on collectivistic value, whereas Western culture emphasises individualism, assertiveness and independence. However, Based on this research, Marlena refutes this notion as it was found that international students would voice their opinions and challenge their instructors in class. These international students would express their preference for a more relaxed, independent and active learning in Australia. Um, these students strongly believe that it allowed them to have a deeper understanding of their learning materials. This finding is also supported by Ladd and Ruby that many international students preferred a direct experience style of learning and they were able to adapt to different learning environments and embrace a new learning style. Especially in an ESL <coughs> learning context, it may be challenging for international students to fully understand their instructors. Therefore, some are highly dependent on the instructors for guidance during their course to clarify issues. And Piper, in 1989 paper, suggests the importance of instructors to create a supportive learning environment for these international students so as to build their confidence in an academic setting. Ladd and Ruby draws attention to the debate regarding whether students should alter their learning style or whether instructors should alter their teaching style. And from this research, Marlena found that international students participated more in classes with tutors who were motivating, accepting and interesting. There were also instances where tutors were impatient and condescending, which made international students unwilling to participate in class. And it can be argued that both students and the instructor should cooperate in adjusting their teaching and learning styles for the best outcome. Um, other, than, other than language, immigrants have to undergo a range of processes when settling into a foreign country. Language, lifestyle and socio-cultural problems are potential stresses that arise for international students. The first aspect that will be examined is language. Language is a major factor that influences both the student academically and socially in Australia. And it, was, and it can be argued that English taught in China and in other Pacific country, Asian Pacific countries may be insufficient for students to be fluent in their interpersonal communication skills in Australia. Through their research, Rupert Wern Smith 
observed that international students, particularly Asian students, had difficulties in understanding lecturers, answering questions, and taking notes. This was due to the inability to comprehend fully and to keep up with their lecturer and tutor's pace of speech. To overcome this issue, it was noted that these students would approach library staff for assistance and attend workshops to improve their English language. Therefore, it is necessary for different disciplines, for, sorry, for universities to provide these English language um, facilities so that they are able to overcome this issue. Um, from a social perspective, English language skills has an impact on international students' ability to interact and socialize with English-speaking peers. <coughs> um, a study has observed that the higher level of English language proficiency allowed international students to relate to relate better to locals. It was found that Chinese students particularly had poor interaction with international with Australian students because each race tended to communicate with only people of the same race. This is most likely because support gained from other international students of the same race helped them to adjust psychologically. However, um, Yakunina Weigo suggests that the international students should be encouraged to join social organisations and clubs. This will allow them to adapt better to the lifestyle in Australia and practice speaking to locals, which will ultimately improve fluency in speech and writing. International students also face financial stresses that can negatively impact on succeeding in an ESL context. Living away from their home country, international students have to manage their finances by themselves and expenses for accommodation, transport, and tuition fees. And these all contribute to acculturation stress. So to cope with the stressor, it was reported by Bugogo and Smith that international students were more likely to look for their friends for support and therefore universities should should make it more aware to students that there are services that allow them to um, seek help and assistance in Australia. Next, I will discuss the predictive validity of IELTS and TOEFL. And IELTS and TOEFL help to determine the proficiency of international students' language, uh, English language. However, their, their predictive, um, sorry, their validity and the ability to predict the level of success in international student studies can be challenged. Firstly, ours will be analyzed. Elder, in her 1992 paper, discovered, discovered relatively higher correlation between IELTS and difficulties, in, difficulties facing coursework. This is supported by Huang's findings, which indicate that international <laughs> students with higher IELTS results tended to perform better academically. However, IELTS does not guarantee international students' economic success, as it was discovered that students with higher, sorry, that with students <coughs> that had higher IELTS scores did fail in some of the assessments, whereas students that, um, that achieved lower IELTS scores actually performed better in Australia. Um, the next aspect that will be discussed in the predictive, is the predictive validity of TOEFL. This test assesses the student's listening comprehension, written expression, and reading comprehension. Similar to findings of IELTS, TOEFL is highly correlated with high academic performance. Since TOEFL examines students' comprehension abilities, those with higher TOEFL scores were able to communicate better with others. It can be concluded that both IELTS and TOEFL are useful measures of international students' academic success. However, different disciplines at universities have varying requirements for English language proficiency. Therefore, other forms of testing can be done to assess an international student's readiness to undertake tertiary studies at Australian universities. And these are communicative testing, revision tests, and peer assessments. Revision tests can be useful for students to consolidate their learning and build confidence in their knowledge. It was found that tests induce a sense of insecurity in many international students, as found by Gokinski. Um, revision tests may be able to familiarize students with the style of the exam, highlight any concerns, and instructors are able to use this to gauge their success levels. Um, the results showed from the study sh showed improvements in students' exam results after using revision tests as a form of testing. Um, another form of testing that can be used is um, communicative, communicative testing, where um, where communicative 
because communication skills are required to cope, especially in an ESL setting. Some of the international students strongly believe that their lack of fluency in English limits their education success. Communicative tests are similar to any other test that evaluates the proficiency levels and highlights the students' strengths and weaknesses. Um, it suggests that the acquisition of second language is most efficient when the individual is naturally exposed to it, especially through communication. And a main of international and local Australian students. The challenges that international students face while studying in an ESL context and the use of files and TOEFL to predict the validity, to predict the level of um, academic success international students have at university. In regards to learning styles, the main argument presented is that international students are not rigid in their learning styles and are interested in adopting the new, the way local students learn and are able to adapt to their new learning environment. And ongoing research could examine in more detail the question of appropriate testing to determine the readiness of international students to undertake tertiary studies in an English medium setting such as Australia. Thank you, Adam. I invite the uh, members from the first session, please, to come and have a seat. I know everyone might have to pop off because of family member illness. Uh, so Andrew and Anna and Graham, please, you can come and take a seat. Here you go, Adeline. <laughs> no, thank you so much. It's great to have you up here. Well, we've got uh, quite a few minutes left. We may even break a little bit earlier for morning tea, but uh, I'm sure there are some questions that members of the audience may like to pose to one or other of the presenters. So I'll throw the floor open. Jen, oh, sorry, Mr. Tai, please. Come back to you next, Jen. Thank you. I'm Tai. Can you hear me? I've been a long time observer of language use, and I've been particularly exercised by the existence of essay writing means, like diploma means. Essays are all that we spoke by the internet. We are hateful. So how do we turn these essays? Are they original? <laughs> <laughs> because they have been written especially for that student by an originator, and it's passed on to the student, and the student submits it an original essay. So where do we draw the line? We are getting a lot of students, and I know of their existence, as many of us here know, that many of these essay writing news is this up there. So a couple of hundred dollars, yes. you could have your essay written in a couple of hours, or a couple of days, depending on how much you are willing to pay. So, what do we make of this? Very murky situation out there. Yes, thank you. Why to that? Yeah, it's a real challenge. I mean, uh, in one sense, I think the the debate that has to be had was about how the technology of writing, the availability of information, and the ability to, you know, very quickly, you know, take a text that's in one place written for one thing and sort of incorporated into a new text um, was the challenge and that was, that was it still is the, the challenge and it has to be, from a teacher and a writing point of view, it has to be acknowledged. The way people write now is very different than the way they used to write. So uh, it was always possible that someone could cheat the system so that a writer could get someone else to do the work for them get someone else to... So, so th in a sense, that doesn't worry me as much because it's not a philosophical problem that's interest from a teaching and writing point of view. It's not a problem that I actually have to deal with, in a sense, philosophically. It's just, it's always been the case that people could get someone else to do their work for them, and <laughs> if you have enough money, you could uh, cheat the system. 
and I'd be interested in looking at, I guess, that one I could look at from the point of view of what are the social and institutional structures that mean that kind of practice of, you know, what's going on that a student would want to do that, that, that they would want to use that sort of service. Um, it's an economic question. It's an economic question of, you know, the value of degrees versus the time that people have available and their motivations and so on. So it's really interesting economic questions. Also inadequate in the EAP. And, and look, very much, yeah, that's one of the big social and structural conditions that, that when the demands on students are so high to produce work and the expectation is of work at a certain standard, I guess that shifts the economic driver, if you like, the motivator for people to do things that are not necessarily what we want. In a sense, it's a really difficult problem because there's no software that can identify this. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess it, for me, it's a bit less interesting philosophically. And I say to my students, well, <laughs> I think you would know that you were doing the wrong thing if you did that. So, and I won't know, but that's, that's how it is. So it's, it's those students who are genuinely trying to write something you know, effectively, but, but are unsure how to acknowledge the, the sources that they're using, unsure about what it is they're expected to actually do to produce an original argument or not. That's what's interesting to me. Right. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's probably your area of expertise in there. Uh, personally, um, I feel that as an individual, I'm at university to learn. And for me, as, as an individual, the whole idea of doing that is just the opposite reason for being here. But it gets down to the motive of the person why they're at the university or whatever institution they're at. Um, I think you have to look within yourself and say, well, you know, am I going to pay someone so I get a HD or do I want to enjoy the process of producing the paper and feel happy as a human being that I've done a good job doing it myself? And I think uh, the majority of students, and I have no um, basis on which to make this generalisation, but the majority of students would be wanting to do their own work because you know, essentially, as human beings, you want to feel proud of what you've achieved. But there's no doubt that in economic imperity, in some circumstances, where students are under enormous pressure. Well, I think, I mean, yeah, I, I agree completely that the whole thing, I, did, I don't know that I thought that I was a critical EAP, but now I do, thanks to <laughs> Graham and, uh, um, and Lund's papers, I didn't realise how much of a critical EAP person was. I hope there's a bit of pragmatism in there too. But I think I think that's kind of what you're alluding to, is that, that 
without examining it, we do those sort of things as academics, and we set up tasks that duplicate our situation and what we need to do, you know, to cite citation practices as part of being an academic. And, uh, and certainly it's so easy to forget how long it takes to learn those cultural practices, quite apart from the language and just the technical side of it, maybe that's not so long. But it can take years to become, you know, to, to see those practices as essential and vital and, and valuable. Uh, but, but students don't necessarily share those. I, I really think, yeah, I mean, it's also, is it interesting to them? Is that what students have come to university for necessarily? Are those two things the same? Is it the same thing that you follow these cit citation practices and write essays of a certain genre and type? Is that the same as the critical and perceptive um, communication of ideas? Could they be separate? Could you be writing critically, perceptively, communicating, communicating and developing knowledge in ways that don't involve those academic citation practices uh, without necessarily going into uh, just copying or uh, producing something avant-garde or something outside of the box of your how, how does a student <laughs> feel about those sort of... Um... That was a really interesting uh, comment, so thank you. Uh, brings me back to my first year days. Um, and as I always thought I was a very strong academic um, in high school, but when I, when I came to university, like for everything I thought I knew was thrown out the door. And you know, the first assignment you get, it's got to prove this, you've got to do research and there's nothing that, there's nothing that prepares you for that. Mm -hmm. And um, it was only until I did the, the ABS 1340 um, interactive purposes paper during summer school that, um, I mean, I'm doing 13 papers so, simultaneously and but it was only through this 100-level paper um, that um, Dr. Hesu Mary runs um, that I learned about how to, how to write an academic Paper, you know, what does um, society mean? What is plagiarism? But um, I, I hadn't been exposed to that in any of my other courses, despite having done three or three at the university. Well said. Um, I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, when I started my little chat, that I was doing Spanish and Latin American studies, and last year I did a subject called The Idea of Europe, and uh, Natalie Burke from European Studies said, to me, look, your essays have got some great ideas, but you should go and have a chat to Matthew, um, which I didn't do because I was pretty busy all the time. And uh, I had a shoulder reconstruction in January and it provided me with the opportunity to go to summer school. And I was there with my sling, and uh, I can say it's the best thing I ever did. Uh, I've done postgraduate studies in business and computing, diplomas in lots of different areas, but I've never written at a humanities level. And whilst before my career in the police force, I worked in the corporate world where I wrote prospectuses, and I thought I was quite a capable writer. I wrote a book on the wine industry, which uh, was for a client. And thought, no, I've got these skills. But it's only now that I realised that I didn't have the skill to structure an essay correctly. I'd never learnt the citation process, and again, I'd never thought about those adverbial causes. And things like that. So, um, Matthew's uh, without uh, patronising Matthew, uh, you're, uh, it was invaluable. I almost believe that this should be a mandatory subject for all university students, first year, PAP. Let's move on. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And it seems to me what Jan was saying, um, using citations correctly, um, integrating into your work as part of finding your voice. And that seems to relate back to um, the critical um, EAP that you, um, you, it seems to me that you need to find what you want to say and then you have the confidence to, to quote and cite other people because they fit in. You've got some sort of framework within which their work fits. Um, that's kind of like that. I do think it's something to do with finding your way and finding your voice. Um, I guess from, from my presentation, um, I, I came 
trying to realize that um, when you what we don't have the pragmatism or the structure or um, understanding of academic conventions before you write a paper or do an academic piece, um, it can be difficult to allow the flow of ideas or creativity. Mm -hmm. So you um, yeah, that's what the discussion is about, but what's the what's the middle ground? Mm -hmm. Where does um, where you should create a good stop or you should create that good start? Oh, I think it's great to hear from, you know, because, mm -hmm. yeah, as you say, you know, academics become so acculturated to this is the only way we can see the world through these sort of communicative practices of writing essays in a particular format. And it becomes very rigid and very, it's hard to see and it's hard to remember how, how students might see it and how, you know, does it impede creativity or does it allow, allow for creativity? I mean, I, I think I'm really encouraged by your papers that, that you know, that, that learning some of those sort of forms and structures doesn't necessarily impede your, your creative impulse to, to write something new and to... Certainly, I think um, if you look in uh, the city of Monash, uh, has 12 multi official multicultural groups, I believe. So it's pretty diverse. And Monash University naturally is diverse and an international university. Um, I think the important thing about language, be it English or Chinese or Spanish or anything, is that it involves a cultural component as well. Consequently, just knowing English doesn't mean you really have insight into the Australian society and consequently the conventions of the Australian University. So it's pretty important that um, people develop relationships with uh, local people, natives as opposed to non-natives, so they can get a thorough understanding or a better understanding of the society in which they live, so they can improve their, uh, their English in the context of the university model. I agree. I mean, yeah, it's a real, it's one of the challenges is to not just have programs for one type of student. Um, as a chair of student returning to university uh, last year after about 32 years away from university, um, one of my biggest uh, and scariest challenges for me was dealing with sighting and referencing and plagiarism. I confess I had several meltdowns over it in the summer break leading up to my first semester. And I was very fortunate in that it was suggested to me by a member of the um, student services that I undertake academic writing as 
one of my first subjects, which I did. And uh, well, very invaluable, absolutely invaluable. <coughs> and uh, has had an enormous and very positive influence on my academic career since. My question is, this is a structure that we have to work within. Um, I personally don't find it limits my creativity. I, I think it's just a structure, it's a framework that I do my work within. And as it is such a vital piece of academia, why is my subjects like academic writing not compulsory for first year students as an introduction? When you come in either as a student from high school when everything they've learned gets thrown out the window or myself after 32 years away from an academic environment, literally, well, let's face it, back in the 70s in the Conservatorium of Music at Melbourne University, nobody even talked about plagiarism. Um, so, you know, why, why aren't these subjects actually literally a, a compulsory part of the curriculum to help students ease into this situation, and particularly as I know what a positive influence to have on my son? I'm not sure any of us can answer. I agree with you 100%, especially uh, mature age students. Uh, we're here to learn. Yeah. It's a bonus that I'll get a diploma or a degree at the end of the course, but I'm here to learn, and um, that's why I'll copy someone else's work or plagiarise. But uh, certainly, English faculty purposes provide a fantastic framework for anyone, so I'll commend it to any student, uh, and especially for uh, international students as well, because yeah. they certainly need that, that assistance to get the results they want and to understand how to use their own it's a great environment for that. I think in the class I was in at the same time, there was you know, a predominance of international students. So they were taking the initiative to improve themselves for their academic careers. We've got one more question from the gentleman here. And I thought to reassure people that the event was put together not to promote the United States. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for your kind comments. <laughs> Yeah, um, just in response to the comments, I also feel that there should be a kind of uh, a process of transition in the first year, especially in the first semester, for students to uh, sort of prepare themselves to be able to sign. I don't think they should be, uh, you know, they should plunge straight into the process of citation. I think uh, it's, it's a gradual process, and especially when you work in the student services, you come across students who have the ideas but are not able to put together an essay because of the structural problems associated with it. So they're slightly apprehensive about the citations and those other things, but they do know what they want to say and they, they do try to articulate those ideas. But yes, getting the details right suddenly seems to occupy a lot of, of, of people's you know, people's attention and, and you know so maybe if, if first year concentrated on a little bit more on the on the where and why, and, and less on, on you know, how you do a secondary citation properly in APA, MLA, or, or whatever. And I think that's uh, something that academics need to be conscious of, because we're so uh, much a part of the system that we forget about who, uh, those who are just about to embark on their academic journey. Thank you. Oh. I, I think we might break for a cup of tea or coffee a little bit early before I come to be in front of the clock and behind it. I really urge, and I know some people have other commitments, and I thank those people who can only stay for the morning session, but uh, after the cup of coffee or tea, we have uh, two postgraduate presentations and uh, a process will be led by Clifford Sawyer, which is strong to come back and hear next day postgraduate perspective on some of the issues which have so brilliantly been raised already by Anna and Graham and Adeline and I think introduced uh, superbly by Andrew. So to conclude the first session, firstly thank you very much for your participation thus far and very much thank you to our <coughs> presenters. It's a bit cold outside, so please feel free to grab your cup of tea and coffee and come back in and have a chat in maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Thank you.
Yeah, I need my shoes. 